But find your way there now to Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. Let's remember that Paul was in prison in Rome, and, and uh, this was the first of his two imprisonments in Rome. The first one he was released, and the second one he was, we believe, beheaded. So this is the first one that he wrote uh, to this church in Philippi. And we pick up at the, the end of verse 18 or the beginning of verse 19. It just depends on how your English Bible orders these paragraphs. But we begin with, yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Christ Jesus, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. This is the word of the Lord. Well, think about the, uh, the, those times in your life where you desire to do one thing, but you are wise enough or knowledgeable enough, just mature enough to know that Though you desire to do one thing, there's something that you need to do instead. And so, um, confession is good for the heart, right? I desire to eat a whole bag of Oreo cookies just about every day. I do. Amen. And maybe in heaven I'll be able to do it. (laughs) When I was 19 in the army, I did do it. But I still desire all these years later, even though I know it's not good for me, what I need to do is take care of myself, right? We may desire just to stay in bed tomorrow, but we know we need to get up and get to work. Um, and maybe, maybe you know tomorrow morning you need to get up and exercise, you need to go for a walk, or you need to do something physically active just to get, get everything flowing again. We desire so often to be in the loop and to be aware of current events. But we need to sit with Jesus, right? The unhurried time. I saw recently that social media has many benefits, and one of them will be on the day of judgment when we have the nerve to say, Lord, I didn't have time to pray. He will say, really? All the time we spend on the Internet, but we have no time to pray. We desire, but we need Another confession is, so often I desire to escape from this culture. I'm just tired of it. Increasingly, I find I don't have a home here. And I just want to retreat. And I don't mean like a vacation. I mean a house in the woods, isolated, where I don't have to engage anymore. A moat would be helpful. That's what I desire. But I need to engage the culture with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But not just me, all of us. He saved us for that. I think it's probable in in our fellowship today that we have some that with full sincerity, no fear of condemnation before the Lord, would agree with the Apostle Paul and say, these words are my heart today. Verses 23 and 24. Listen to these words. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Some of you have that heart today. Hallelujah. You're not the first one into that room of living. There's the Apostle Paul sitting there waiting for you to join him in that reality. You desire to depart and be with Christ, but you remain because you know it's far more necessary necessary. Now last week in verses 12 through 18, we saw that Paul was rejoicing because the gospel was advancing in pretense and in truth. He's rejoicing. He doesn't care necessarily the circumstances, the heart motive behind these men or perhaps these women that are preaching this true gospel. He doesn't care why they're doing it, even if it's costing him something. He is rejoicing. 
And in those verses, he was looking backwards. He was giving them this circumstantial update to, to how he's doing, why he's in prison, and how, he, uh, how the gospel is advancing in that. What we look at now is Paul turns from looking back at circumstances to looking, looking forward about what is to come. And he faces a dilemma. He confesses that he would rather die and go be with the Lord. But he needs to live and to help them. You see why I'm saying we will face those moments of desires? Versus needs. Paul desired one. He recognized the other was necessary. So in this dilemma, I think he makes a staggering confession. For to me, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. That's 121. Look at that. For to me, to live is Christ. Why did Paul live Christ? Now just pause. Why do you live? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? To live is Christ. Now many, many people we know to live is the pursuit of joy or pleasure. To live is the praise of man. To live is accomplishment. To live is physical pleasure. We live in an overly sexualized culture. And that's why many people live the pursuit of that. To live is Christ. And therefore, to die is gain. I say, Paul, how? And I hope you wrestle with the scriptures like that. How? How'd you say it, brother? I'm not, I'm not doubting you. But I read this inspired word and I don't see it in my heart sometimes, Paul. How? How is it possible? And why isn't it my confession, my constant confession? Why? And so in this passage, we see how Paul was able to say that. And for us, we see how we can live and die like Paul for the glory of Christ. We're going to see three things here quickly. To live and die for the glory of Christ, we need to be sure of our future salvation. If you don't get them all right now, we're going to walk through these. Be sure of our future salvation. Anticipate Christ, or anticipate Christ being honored above all. And then desire Christ above all. So let's think first. How do we live and die for the glory of Christ? First, be sure. Sure of future salvation. Too often we narrowly define and understand salvation as the past. And the Bible certainly has an understanding, a definition of salvation being something in the past. But never forget the present salvation that we are walking in and the future salvation that we are looking forward to. Amen? That was not persuasive. <laughs> that sounded like a tired group of people and that's okay right but lord willing this this word will warm our hearts as we look forward to the future salvation so let's look back beginning in verse 18 where he says yes and i will rejoice remember he just said whether christ is preached in pretense or in truth i will rejoice and so now he doubles down yes and i will rejoice for i know that through your prayers and the help of the spirit of jesus christ this will turn out for my deliverance. My current imprisonment and the upcoming trial will actually turn out for my deliverance because you're praying for me. And the Spirit of the Lord is with me, ministering to me, helping me. He is present in all of this. Paul was sure of an outcome because they prayed. I wonder, when you pray, is your attitude more often than not, boy, I hope this works out. Probably we will, if not, frequently go there from time to time we will go there it is very much like cross your fingers and hold your breath i just hope against hope that this thing actually turns out the way that i've asked the lord but do you ever stop and think about the sovereignty of god even in prayer and your heart's desires yes we all fight a battle against self-interest we all do but how often do you think the whole reason you desire something and the whole reason you are calling out to the Lord for something is because he intends to give it to you. Don't just hold your breath. Cross your fingers. Boy, I hope this works out. Pray knowing 
It is the Lord who shepherded your heart to that moment of, you know, I should probably pray about this. And believe that the Bible says that if you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. So perhaps the whole reason you're praying for something is God intends to do that thing. That's where Paul was now on the other side of this endeavor, sitting in a prison. And the reason he knew deliverance was his, because word came to him, the church in Philippi was praying for his deliverance. This is remarkable. You see, the world, the flesh, and the devil will always be working in a way until our great shepherd finally crushes the head of the serpent on that last day. They will always be working in a way to tear us apart, to isolate us, to make us feel and think that we've been forgotten, that nobody cares, that we're just left here in isolation to figure this out on our own. After all, Paul was in prison alone. But there was a church, whatever number of mile away, miles away, that they were taking in their heart, taking this brother to the faithful one and saying, mercy, show him mercy. Lord, you know that we still need Paul. Would you set him free for us? And that word traveled all those miles and Paul realized, I'm not alone in this prison. I have the saints in Philippi praying for me. I have the spirit of the living God ministering to me. Charles Spurgeon, the Baptist preacher in London, 19th century. He said, prayer is the rope that rings the bell in the ears of God. Prayer is the rope that rings the bell in the ears of God. Prayer is how we partner with God. It's how we get in on what God is doing. It is our part in what God intends for this world. Do you pray? Do you pray in faith? Do you pray with certainty? Paul asked the church in Ephesus to pray for him. The apostle to the Gentiles asked these people to pray for him. In Ephesians 6, 19 through 20, he said, Pray also for me that the words uh, may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to boldly proclaim the mystery of the gospel. You think at that point in Paul's life where he's already been in prison because of his boldness in proclaiming the gospel, it would have been settled. He crossed that hurdle and it's fine. But now in prison, he's saying, pray that I boldly proclaim the gospel. That is not shrink back from declaring the gospel. Think of the humility of the apostle Paul asking these brothers and sisters to pray. He didn't want to proclaim the gospel by himself. He wanted them to be a part of the bold proclamation of the gospel. Again, that's how we get in on what God is doing. And so he said, I know this will turn out for my deliverance because of your prayers. Isn't it good to be a part of a praying church family? Isn't it a, a tailwind of blessing and strength and affirmation to know that I want you to look around at these people in this room right now and think about those that are not with us in the room but are at home praying for one another it's, it's, it's humbling to think that people have talked to the almighty on your behalf they've mentioned you by name and he knows you by name and he loves you you are dear to him. And so it's, prayer is not twisting his arm, hoping to persuade God to do something. You're affirming his will. It is a joy to be a part of a praying church. This morning, I don't know who it was, if it was somebody in this room, thank you. Maybe it was somebody not in this room. But about 6.55, the Lord stopped me in my tracks. I've got my morning routine. And it means at 7 o'clock, I wake the house up. It's the Lord's day. Let's get up. And at 6.55, something just hit me. And I just sat down on my bed with a glad heart for the blessings of God and the presence of God. And it was like halfway through, so about 6.57, it occurred to me, somebody is praying for me right then 
boy, I stood up strong and glad-hearted, anticipating the mercy and presence of God for this day. I need it. We need it, don't we? It's good to be a part of people, a family that pray. So if prayer is, in fact, that rope that rings the bells in the ears of God, brothers and sisters, let's ring it. (laughs) Let's ring it often. Let's ring it passionately. Let's ring it as loud as we can into the heart of our good Lord, our Savior, our Shepherd. And we then will join with Paul in having assurance of God's deliverance. I think we need to ask, what did Paul exactly mean by this word deliverance here? What was he talking about when he said he is sure this will turn out for his deliverance? Well, he never says explicitly, though the last half of this passage, 25 and 26, does seem to say he's he's certainly including this aspect of being released from jail to continue a ministry with the brothers and sisters in Philippi. But you know what we also learn? He was ministering to the brothers and sisters in Philippi without being released. That's why we have this letter. And so that's why we don't want to say he absolutely with full assurance meant he's going to get out of jail. He he knew he wasn't going to die right then. And we think he means he was going to get out of jail. But I want to say, I think ultimately what he meant was the future salvation. That word deliverance just means salvation. This will turn out for my salvation. This will turn out for my deliverance. Now, here's why I say I think Paul was more so talking about a future salvation. Paul was quoting, write this down, Job 13, 16. Job 13, 16. So in, in, the, in the Greek version of the Old Testament, it's called the Septuagint. What Paul says here is verbatim, Job 13, 16. And maybe you remember, maybe you do not remember, but Job 13 is where this suffering man, Job, this righteous man, Job, was was talking back to the Lord, he was praying to the Lord about some friends of his that we learn in time had become what? Miserable comforters. These friends, these brothers started off on the brother route, but they turned into blamers and excusers. They, 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 they started down this road of blessing. They turned into this place of burden. Does that sound like Paul and what he was talking about last week in chapter in verses 12 and following? Where he was saying, some are seeking to injure me. Some brothers, they do not have my good in mind. In other words, Paul is identifying with Job here. A righteous man that's suffering unjustly now at the hands of people that were close to him. And Job was not talking about immediate relief. Job was talking about when he would see his Redeemer. He was talking about the final salvation, the future salvation in the presence of the Lord. And so what we know is, if nothing else, Paul knew one day he would be free of that prison. He didn't know when that day was, but he knew he would be delivered. He would be saved because the saints prayed for him. And because the Spirit of the Lord was helping him, even though he was bound in prison. You see, Paul knew that Philippians 1.6 was not just about the saints in Philippi, but it was about himself as well. That he who began a good work in Paul, in him, would bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. And so this whole letter has a, has a forward look about this great day of Christ Jesus. This great day of full and final salvation. So he's not merely looking to circumstantial relief. He's looking to final relief. And he was sure of it. Brother, sister. What is your assurance based on? What gives you peace today? Think about assurance of salvation. Think about being settled in Christ. Is it merely because at some time in the past you made a decision for Jesus? I hope you remember making a decision for Jesus. (laughs) And I hope you point back to it with full assurance. But think more than that. For Paul had assurance because of the presence of the Spirit ministering to him, helping him, carrying him along. In fact, write down these two verses, 2 Corinthians 1, 22, 2 Corinthians 1, 22, and Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. 
2 Corinthians 1, 22, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Both of these verses say the presence of the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord is the guarantee of our salvation. The Spirit of the Lord is the guarantee, the seal. We have the imprint of God on us. And so for Paul, it was not merely a Damascus Road reality. It was a present reality because of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Do you know the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life? Do you know whether or not the, the Spirit of Christ is in you and near you, holding you, carrying you? Do you see the evidence? I think this is more of a one-on-one -on -one counseling question, <laughs> uh, a pastoral home visitation question, because I would love for you to answer. Where do you see the presence of the Spirit of God in your life. And I don't just mean the guy didn't run the red light. We thank God for that. But that's a common grace to this world. I mean the spirit of the living God inside of you. You're bearing fruit for him. You're, you're not anxious and chaotic like the people of this world. But you are peaceful. Like the spirit of the living God. Where do you see his presence in your life? Where do you see that he began a good work in you? Those first fruits of the spirit. You know, another way of saying it is. Are you looking to Jesus? Because if you look to Jesus, you're going to bear the fruit of Christ. So we're not just talking about a mental agreement. He is the Lord. We're talking about a wholehearted surrender, quieted now by his presence, bearing fruit, that evidence that you're looking to him. That he has not just walked into your heart, but he has removed the heart of stone and given you a new heart, as he said he would do. A new heart. So don't believe, and please don't say, I've always been that way. I guess I'll just be this way until I die. No, no, no. You are a new creation in Christ. And we want to put off that which is of the flesh and put on the Spirit of God. That's what Paul did. That's how he had hope in prison. That's how he was sure of his salvation. The Spirit of the Lord was in him and with him. And the people prayed and the Spirit heard the prayer, ministered through the prayer and gave Paul peace and assurance. He knew he'd be delivered from those chains. But more than that, he'd be delivered from this world. Therefore, he could live and die for the glory of Christ. So he was sure of his future salvation. Are you? Or is it just like prayer? You're holding your breath and hoping that it's true. I've told you before, and many of you will amen and affirm this in your own life. Jesus is more real to me than you are. And make no mistake, you're pretty real. <laughs> but he is more real to me. And I am more sure of him than I am of you guys. And many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's no longer merely walking by faith, hoping that it's true, but it is settled in your soul. Jesus Christ died for my sin. He rose for my life. And he promised to return to take me home. And I've leveraged everything on the absolute truth of that. And so many of you would say, amen, that's me as well. That's how we live and die for him, when those things become our reality. But then as we, as we think more about this, we need to also then anticipate, with that being settled, we need to anticipate Christ being honored. Because that's true of me, it will fundamentally change me. Therefore, I know Christ will be honored. Look at verse 20. He says, uh, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope, but I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. So Paul had this eager expectation, this, uh, this anticipation that Christ would be honored. Christ would be lifted up, magnified, exalted in his body. He knew the whole reason he was alive was to proclaim Christ. He knew he was not the center of reality, that what he wanted was not ultimate. Oh, for the Spirit of God to be among us right now and set us free from that. As if God is a slave to what we want. God is a slave to no man. We are his servants. 
brother, sister, believe it or not, he knows better than we do. He knows we may have good desire, good intentions, but they're misplaced. They're deficient. And so when he ta- calls us to lay something aside, as, as Hebrews says, lay aside every weight and sin. So if there's something in your life that's not helping you follow Jesus, in the goodness of his wisdom, he says, lay it aside. That's what Paul did. And for Paul, it meant he laid aside all of these accomplishments of the world. Everything that would have been a resume to give him street credibility to go in and be the resident expert. Chapter 3, he's going to say, that's rubbish. That's trash. Everything the people of the community would have boasted in is trash compared to Christ. And so Christ was his resume. Christ was his credential. Because Christ was his everything. Christ was his hope in life and death. And so it was his eager expectation. Because those things were settled. He's going to live for Christ now. He's going to honor Christ now. Including in his body. He knew he was nothing more than a servant of Christ. That he lived to magnify Christ. And that's why in part he could say in 2 Corinthians 4. That he's just an old clay pot. I mean, no, no harm to your ego, and I'll let the Spirit of the Lord minister to you, but some of you already know this. You're just an old clay pot. You're fragile. You're brittle. And it doesn't take much to upset your, your body and your heart and your mind, does it? Don't fight against that. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, We have this treasure of Christ and His gospel in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. And if, you, if, if Christ is, in fact, your hope in life or death, you want the surpassing power to belong to Him. You want people to see the reason you're kept together, the reason you have hope is Christ. Right? Isn't that what you want people to say at your funeral? She was captured by the Lord Jesus and nothing else. Like a lot of people think about date of birth, date of death, and then that dash. And think about all that dash represents in between date of birth and date of death. There's a whole life there. Don't you want that dash to be Christ? That when you come to the end of your days and the brothers and sisters gather to honor you. That they honor you by honoring the one that you loved with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's why Paul would say, what then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants. Through whom the Lord, uh, through whom you believed as the Lord assigned. We're all just old clay pots. What then is Mitch? Happy birthday. What then is Scott? What then am I? What are you? With a big grin on your face, say an old clay pot for Christ. It's liberating. You exist for the glory of God to show the strength, the wisdom belong to Christ. And that's why Paul would say, What then? In any way, pretense truth. Christ is exalted. Christ is preached. I will rejoice. That's why I live. To make much of him. And so then he says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Oh, man. I'll ask that again. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Whom you have from God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Wow. Glorify God in your body. Because it belongs to him. Is there anything in your life. In light of 1 Corinthians 6.20. That needs to change right now. Glorify God in your body because it belongs to him. Paul is saying, I know I'm going to honor Christ. He's going to be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Can you say that today? 
you know Christ is going to be honored in your body by life or by death. Why do you brush your teeth? (laughs) There's a whole host of reasons. (laughs) Why do you brush your hair? Is it for the glory of God? Why does a bad hair day upset you and frustrate you? Is it for the glory of God? That's where we want to mature too. Children, think about this for a moment. Children. (laughs) You belong to God. Your body belongs to the Savior. And he's wonderful. And he knows what brings joy. And he knows what gives long life. He knows what happiness is where it's found. And so his commands, his instructions are good. Children, you belong to God. Your body is his. Use it for his glory. Take care of it. Teenagers. You belong to God. Nobody wants to make eye contact with me now. You guys belong to God. Take care of that vessel. And as a spiritual father, I want to beg you. Honor God in your body. Honor God in your body. Sexual immorality does not honor God in your body. Shooting it with chemicals to enhance your look does not honor God in your body. He did a great job making you. And he needs no surgeon to enhance anything. Oh, I'm a step on a landmine. He doesn't need your artwork. He doesn't. He did a fine job making you. Honor God in your body. You're feeling pretty good now because the kids and the teenagers are in the crosshair. Senior adults, you're not done yet. I know you're tired. I know you have aches. Honor God in your body. Y'all know the name Charles Haddon Spurgeon. I've already mentioned him once. He was a Baptist minister in London. And, and go, just Google his name and you will die before you read everything this man wrote. Every sermon he preached. Extraordinary ministry. And he died young. I don't remember the exact age, but he was young even by 19th century London standards. Charles Spurgeon was a workaholic. And he worked and worked and worked and he did not sleep. He burnt the candle at both ends. And you know what he said as he was dying? I wish I would have taken care of my body better so I could be here longer for the sheep of Christ. And it's easy to sit back and marvel at all the glorious things of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. But let's not forget the dying man's confession. I should have cared for my body. Let's learn from that. See, the Apostle Paul, he, he, he will confess and through, throughout the Scriptures. He was beaten for Christ. His body was literally crushed. Go read 2 Corinthians chapter 11 at some point and just marvel at the sacrifice of this man. But he saw his whole body exist for the glory of God in Christ. We think that he actually lost his head. If church history is right, he lost his head for the glory of Christ. He surrendered literally his whole body, including his neck, for the advance of the kingdom of God. And so he was saying with full sincerity, I will serve God in my body, by life or by death. I mentioned last week the death of the five missionaries in Ecuador in 1956. And in mentioning that, I don't ever want to minimize the cost. I never want to minimize or just gloss over the profound grief and sorrow that his wife and kids had to, had to uh, endure. Nor do I want to minimize the impact of five lives put out for the name of Christ. They gave everything. And how many millions of people know Christ because five men laid down their life for Christ. They honored Christ in their life and in their death. All we're talking about here, this man in prison, we're just just highlighting the impact of the gospel on a life. 
I'm not saying everyone's going to prison, but I'm saying everyone who knows Christ will surrender all to Christ. You cannot have him as a partial Lord. You cannot take him in one, one aspect of your life while you keep other things hidden from him. He's the Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Now, I know there are things that we will struggle with. I know where there are things that we have not yet had the understanding that we are rebelling against Christ. But I'm saying knowingly, you know that's sinful and you continue to give yourself to that endeavor. What you have said is that sinful ambition or desire is actually your Lord. And you would rather sever yourself from Christ than that sin. That's what unrepentance is. And Paul is saying, God forbid, no way. I've surrendered everything. I will live. And I will die. For Christ. And so he anticipated the next step will honor Christ and the next step will honor Christ and the next step will honor Christ. Do you know that today? Do you know that when you walk out of here today, your midday mannerisms will honor Christ? Your bedtime mannerisms will honor Christ? Your good tomorrow morning, your midweek, your vacation, your, your retirement will honor Christ. And honoring him means living for him. It does not mean coasting. It means living for him, intentionally surrendering all to him. That's how we live and die for the glory of Christ, surrendering all. And that happens, honestly, with where we land this thing. We must, we must desire Christ above all. We won't live and die for him if he is not our supreme delight. He is not our great joy. And that's what Paul is acknowledging. Hear the heart of this servant of Christ here. Verse 21. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ. For that is far, far better if he were to die and be with christ it wouldn't just be better (laughs) be far better can you say that do you even believe that it's possible that there's something better than this world being with christ is better than the best this world has to offer And I don't hold my breath and hope that it's true. I've already been convinced and I'm just waiting for the graduation day. That my next Sunday school promotion will be into glory and I can't wait. Because Christ was everything. It was not a burden to leave this old world behind when Paul thought about death. Death was relief. Death was, there's nothing more enjoyable I will go and be with the Lord. Does your heart today ache to be with Jesus? <laughs> Has nothing to do with age. Has nothing to do with what the world still holds out in front of you and the things you want to see and accomplish in this world. Don't believe that lie. Don't believe it. It's it's great to be married. Amen. And if you can't say amen, please let me talk with you. It is great to be married. It's great to have children. I assume it's great to have grandchildren. It may be better than children. (laughs) As great as all that is. They just pale. Compared to being with. The champion. To be with the king. Does your heart ache today to be with the Lord? If you're a Christian, believe it or not, death is gain. The greatest gain. If you're a Christian, the best is yet to come. As wonderful as your life may have been here, the the best days are still on the horizon. If you're a Christian, the sun is rising. But if you do not know Christ... And you know in your heart whether or not you know Christ. You know whether or not you have truly surrendered all. You have died to self, repented of your sin, placed placed all your weight on Christ. You are trusting in him and him alone, hoping in him and him alone. If you do not know Christ, death is loss. 
It's the greatest loss. And you think this world has been full of sorrow? You have not seen anything yet. The worst is on the horizon. Darkness is next. Loneliness is next. You imagine living in a world where you scream and scream and scream for relief and nobody gives a rip. Nobody comes to rescue. Nobody comes to comfort. By the way, all I did was describe an orphanage. All over this world, there are orphans that have stopped screaming because nobody cares anymore. They have learned in their infant heart and mind, it does no good to cry because nobody's coming. Does that not break your heart? It should, it should inspire us in Christ to do something about that. And all I did was, in talking about an orphanage, to touch our heart, give us a glimpse of the eternal state for those who don't know Christ. They will scream and nobody will care. Nobody's coming for relief. If you don't know Christ, no wonder you avoid death. But if you know Christ, you don't have to fear it. He overcame the grave. The resurrection is sure. And he's promised, an, uh, promised us an eternal inheritance. We are forever with, with. Don't ever lose sight of with the Lord. If everything that fills your heart with joy is wrapped up in this world, it's certainly not far better to die, is it? When I was growing up in South Carolina, um, my dad's mom was called Granny. And uh, my grandpa died when my dad was about 12. And so Granny was a longtime widow, and I don't remember how many kids she had. I think maybe eight or nine. And so then just do the math regarding grandkids. Boy, she went overboard on us. Granny loved us something fierce. And the reason I know Jesus is because Granny prayed for my salvation. Oh. We loved to go to Granny's house, especially when she cooked. Biscuits and gravy. Ooh. She got me to eat fried okra and fried squash and anything she would fry, I'd eat. It really was the highlight of our days when we could all go to Granny's house. And for reasons I will never understand, when I was about 12, she got married. Oh. God bless her. She married a fine farmer. His name was Rob. And he had a great big old house, and so there was more room in the yard for us to play. More family could come over, including Rob's awkward family. Because we weren't awkward. And... Um, just a few years after she got married, she died. I never went back to that house. Did that surprise you? I had no reason to go to the house anymore. The one that I loved was not there. The one that I really didn't know was there. And all these years later, it seems cold for me to say, and I didn't care. I was indifferent towards this man that she married. You see what's happening here? When the one I loved was there, that's where I wanted to be. When the one I loved was no longer there, I had no reason to go. And what I'm saying is, maybe the reason we're so in love with this world is Jesus isn't supreme to us. Because when Jesus is our greatest delight, we will want to be where he is. We'll want to go to Jesus' house. And we'll want to eat, and we'll want to feast, and we'll want to run, and we'll want to jump, and we'll want to sit, and we'll want to hear those stories, and we'll want to laugh until we've embarrassed ourselves laughing. And we'll want to stay long, because the one we love is there. That's all Paul is saying. I just want to go where he is. To live as Christ, therefore to die? Whew. To die is gain. And it hurts that so many have shaped their lives around the cares of this world, the pleasures of this world. That we're, we're looking for pleasure in places where Christ is not. 
We're in the ghetto. We're in the slums. We're, we're just in filth thinking we're going to find hope and joy and full, complete life there. No, we're not. In Christ, there's fullness of joy, pleasures forevermore. And so please, brother, sister, don't wait until you're in prison and everything in this world's been stripped away to say Christ is my all in all. Now, today, Christ is everything. If you don't know him, and I have any respect in your heart, and you trust me to just the smallest degree, if you don't know him, all I would say is call out to him. Don't just take my word for it. Call out to him. And he's more wonderful than you have ever imagined. He's the best friend, the dearest companion. And when you find Christ, your heart has found home and you're satisfied. Which then leaves the rest of this passage that we're not going to ignore. Because what happens here is, is, in fact, let's read this, verse, 25 and follow, uh, verse 24 and following. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and join the faith. So that in me you have ample cause, you may have ample cause to glory in Christ because of my coming to you again. So Paul, after calling himself a servant of Christ, he surrenders his desire. Did you see that? His desire is to depart and be with Christ, but he knows he's a servant of Christ. Therefore, he surrenders his desire to this Lord. And he says, I'm convinced I'm going to live on. I'm going to remain here because the church in Philippi needs me. He knew he still had a purpose in this world. Doesn't it feel good to be needed? Apparently not. Doesn't it feel good to be needed? Y'all didn't know this was supposed to be two-way. <laughs> Some of you should be uber secure in remaining. <laughs> because you're needed. I mean, you guys. My wife knows she's going nowhere anytime soon. <laughs> because we can't live off hot dogs. And my sweet little girl can't have dreadlocks. And she needs a mama. And my boys need more than the thunder of dad. They need the love of mom. And so I tell her all the time, don't you start longing for heaven. Because you're going to be disappointed. You're not going anywhere anytime soon. I need you. Doesn't it feel good to be needed? And what I'm getting at is if... Let me, let me ask you, don't, don't necessarily answer it. Would it bless your heart if somebody came up to you today and said, I still need you. Just being with you helps me love Jesus. Just seeing you helps me not give up. Wouldn't it feel good wouldn't it encourage you and strengthen you if somebody came up to you today and ministered to you in that way? Just being with you encourages me and helps me follow Jesus. Thank you. Say that to somebody. I am begging you. you. You think of what people have gone through today. The sacrifices they've made of sleep and physical stamina to get out of bed to clean themselves up, to brush their hair, to put on the clothes, to drive their car, to come here, to listen now to the long-winded minister still sitting there. Think of all the sacrifice just in that moment. Would you go up in an appropriate way say, thank you. Your presence strengthened me today. Miss, Miss Carolyn, thank you for not giving up, pressing on not giving in to the lie of the world, but continually to serve and to bless those around you. I wish I could see your smile. I could see your eyes smiling right now. What I'm getting at is, you, church, you know we have some in our church that are brokenhearted and lonely. They've lost a loved one and they have remained. And their heart's desire is to go and be with the Lord and with their loved one. But the Lord left them here with us. 
Do you know they left him here? And that's not a burden for you to put up with. But the Lord left him here for your progress and joy in the faith. Do you know that? That's what Paul is saying here. He wanted to go be with the Lord, you guys. But he said, not today. I will remain for your progress, your joy. So what you see is gray hair or a wobble body, unstable. You need to see is your progress and joy. God left you here. Last week, Miss Barbara gave me a quote. Where are you? Right there from Dr. David Jeremiah. If you're not dead, you're not done. If you're not dead, you're not done. God has a work for you. So if you want to quit, I'm saying don't give up. Don't give up. God left you here for a reason. Ladies, don't give up. If you have a unique ministry, don't give up. Encourage. Encourage, bless, build up. You will not regret being the messenger of Christ to someone that just wants to see Jesus today.